everyone. It's Lauren, and today I am joined by Steve um, from the LSAT blog, who's going to sit down and talk with me and answer some of my questions about taking the LSAT. Hey, Lauren. Great to be joining you today, and I'm happy to help however I can. I understand that you're prepping for the LSAT. When are you taking it? Um, I'm planning to be taking it in a couple of months just for my first run through, but I'd like to take it at least twice just to make sure I can get the best score possible. Great, great. So you're thinking to do it in March or to do it in June? I'm thinking of March. I think that's okay. when I'll take it and then I'll take it again in June before I start applying. Okay, great. I would definitely recommend if possible trying to take it March and June and be done with it because July is going to be partially digital. And oh, it is? Yeah, it is. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> news from LSAC. So um, LSAC has for a long time been criticized for being the only grad level exam that's still paper and pencil format. Mm -hmm. But due to criticism and in part due to the competition from the GRE, LSAC has sped up its process of digitizing the LSAT. And so starting July 2019, half of all test takers will be assigned the digital format, half will be assigned paper and pencil, and LSAC chooses for you and doesn't give you any advance notice. So wow. <laughs> that's, that's not a situation you want to be in, especially since they're using a tablet that has some restrictions on it that are not ideal, like a countdown clock you can't get rid of. So it's kind of nerve inducing. And then mm -hmm. there's all, you can't draw a free hand on the tablet. So that being said, if you end up, if anyone watching this happens to be in that situation, we'll, you'll make the best of it and we'll have resources to help you out. But in the meantime, if you're watching this in the near term, try to get it done now. So I'm glad to hear that you're thinking March and June. One thing that comes to mind about March is that if you, how, how much time do you have to study between now and then? Let me ask that first. Well, I'm a full-time student and I also have a research grant that I'm working on. Um, so I am pretty busy. So for the most part, at least at the beginning, it'll just be weekends and any time when I'm able to study. So um, not a whole lot of time that's just devoted to studying for the LSAT. How many hours per week would you say can you study? Um, maybe four or five, not, not much more than that. Four to five hours per week. That's, that's yeah. not a ton. I'd say if you could step it up, that would be ideal, but obviously you always have competing priorities. Mm -hmm. So I would say you could register for both March and June if you haven't done so already. Definitely register sooner rather than later. Get the best possible test center. But a few weeks out before March, if you feel like you're not ready, if your practice test scores aren't where you want them to be, then I would suggest withdrawing from March and taking in June instead. Okay, good to know. Because you can't expect a ma magnific magnificent, huge score increase in the final couple of weeks, but you may get a slight boost over that time. So let's say your goal was a 170, your mm -hmm. score 165. Yeah, you could still go ahead, plan for March, and then pull out if you need to. You could withdraw. Law schools will never even know that you were registered, but you don't get to keep your, you, you lose your application fee for the LSAT. Yeah. But then June, you have plenty of time between now and then. So even four to five hours per week could be enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. And also, once I graduate this May, I'm going to have a lot more free time that I can just dedicate to studying. So if, you know, if it doesn't work to take it sooner, I at least know that by June, I will have had, you know, a solid month of just studying. That's an awesome position to be in. And that makes me feel like June is definitely going to be the one for you. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, so that's, that's good stuff. Um, what, one, one other thing I wanted to mention, by the way, is that law schools don't average multiple LSAT scores. Mm -hmm. and those that say they do, don't. So if you do end up having both a March and June score on your record, it's totally fine. They'll consider the highest. The only reason I recommend withdrawing if you're nowhere near where you want to be is that, that you only have so many LSAT takes you want to have on your record. Mm -hmm. So let's say March didn't go well, June didn't go well either for some freak reason, then you're going to be taking maybe a July, maybe September, and it starts to rack up more and more takes on your record. So I'd say three or four is okay, but beyond that, it starts to look a little shaky. So I'd say if you're just taking it for the first time now in March, then that's totally fine. Okay, good to know. And you would say like anything more than three starts to look a little iffy to law schools? Yeah, it does. I mean, let's say you have three scores and one cancellation, that's totally fine. Or two and two, that's also fine. But if you start to have five, six, seven, then they start to, it starts to raise some questions like, what's this person doing here? How come they can't yeah. manage their competing priorities and take it when they're ready? Especially since you can withdraw even up to the day before. Law schools won't know. So it requires just having a little bit of 
forethought and planning to make the best possible decision about whether you should take it or not. Yeah, good to know. Thank you for explaining that so clearly. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. And if you do just want to take a, a dry run mm -hmm. without having a score on your record or a take on your record, a couple of options. There are plenty of great proctor apps and YouTube videos that simulate test day conditions with the timing, even with a little bit of noise as well like distractions. So that's one thing to consider as an alternative. The other thing is that a lot of major prep companies like Kaplan Princeton Review, they offer free proctored exams, mainly for marketing purposes to promote their courses, but you can go in and take it for yourself and you can even bring your own exam if you want to, if, you're, if you don't want to do the one that they're administering. So those mm -hmm. are some options. And then plenty of other companies offer proctored ones for a fee as well. Well, that's good to know also. So when are you taking the, what, so what are your, what's your goal score and where are you scoring now? What are some um, of your major problem areas? Yeah, my, my goal score is 170. I'd like to get above that if I can, but that's kind of my cutoff point that, you know, I need to get above that. Um, and then right now I've taken three LSAT um, prep tests and I got a, I'm trying to remember, a 160, a 158, and a 164. So, I mean, I'm generally just around 160, so I need to raise it 10 points. Okay, and how much have you improved up to this point, would you say? Have you noticed a significant increase at all? Um, no, not really. I kind of just took them all blind, and so I got different scores, but in the same range. Cool. Well, the good news is that you haven't increased yet, so there's still mm -hmm. potential to increase. Everyone improves somewhat no matter what kind of studying they do, just from increased familiarity with the exam. So if you haven't had it, that increase yet, don't worry, it's coming. And even for March, you have two months to make some gains in your understanding. So have you noticed any trends in particular, weak areas between games, reasoning, reading comp? What stands out to you? Well, it's kind of funny. I actually thought that the logic games would be my strongest suit, and they're my weakest by far. That's where I miss the most questions, and it just takes me longer than any of the other sections. It's the only one where I'm worried about hitting the time limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Your games can be really tough at first. They are learnable, though. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed any particular types of logic games that give you trouble? Um, it's it generally, I do fine for like the first couple ones, and then I'll trip myself up on one question, and then I miss the next couple because I'm still thinking with clearly some sort of flawed logic that's then affecting the rest of the questions in one set. So yeah. if I miss one in a set, I miss basically the whole set. So I know there's something off with the way I'm considering it as a whole. Right, so my recommendation there would be go back to fundamentals, go back to the rules of the game. Make mm -hmm. sure that you've correctly diagrammed all the rules related to that game and double check. It's, it's worth it because if you have one rule off or you forget a rule, the mm -hmm. whole game falls apart. So double check them, diagram them, make sure that you have a consistent symbolic note-taking strategy that works for you. I'd recommend doing all capital letters for the mm -hmm. variables and making sure that everything's as neat and clean as possible because it's very easy to mistake one letter for another sometimes and then it all falls apart. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thing. I do do the uh, all capital letters and I, I'm wondering if there's a better way to draw it all out. What I do is I write out all the rules and just use the letters, but then I don't make, I don't make charts. I don't do anything else. Um, although I've seen people doing those, I'm just not exactly sure where they come from. Yeah, yeah. So you definitely want to have a diagramming strategy aside from just the rules themselves. You should have some sort of main diagram. Typically, if the game has an ordering or linear component, you could have several slots laid out horizontally. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a grouping game, you could have long conditional chains potentially. But you also want to have some flexibility in your approach as well. So I would definitely recommend getting a logic games guide of some kind or using videos. I have a ton of free video explanations on my YouTube channel for the vast majority of LSAT logic games. Then I also have some stuff covering the fundamentals. So you can consider checking that, checking that out. I'll give you a link to some specific playlists if you want to provide them for every, anyone watching on your channel. Oh yeah, definitely. But, yeah, great, of course. So I would say look at some explanations to give you some ideas and then look at a textbook of some sort if you need a foundation. It's too complex to reinvent the wheel on this. You know, yeah. if you're studying over a period of three months or five months, that's a decent amount to get familiar with it, but there are plenty of people, myself included, who've been doing this for over 10 years. And so we've developed these strategies over time and tested them and seen what works and what doesn't. And 
it's not enough to just get questions correct. You also have to get them correct in the time allotted. So even if you're doing something that's technically correct if it, or accurate, if it's not getting you there fast enough, then it's not really serving you because you got to be able to do it all in 35 minutes. And speaking of timing, you know, you said first couple of games might be okay. Beginning of a game might be okay. I want you to get to the point where on an easier game, you could blast through it with confidence in the basics related to that game. But then you build up a time bank for the tougher games that come later. So there are some easy games that with the proper conceptual understanding, you could do in like six minutes. And that extra 245, you can apply to a tougher game later in the section, especially some of these newer curveball games that don't really fit in your category. That's, yeah, that's definitely a good strategy. And I have noticed as a trend across all sections, um, I miss a lot more the further down I go. So, you know, first five minutes, first 10 minutes, totally fine. And then if I'm gonna miss anything, I'll miss two or three questions right at the end of each section. So I know I'm trying to get it done and push for time or maybe just a little tired. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, one thing I would say is make sure you're doing the questions in order that works for you so that you're, if you're running out of time, you're at least you're leaving the toughest ones for last. So I'd say start with orientation questions. They're, they're the gimmies that get you warmed up. Then you have your local questions that have an if statement, like if X is on slot three, what happens? Mm -hmm. And finally, you have your more global questions that are more general, like what in general must be true. If you save those for last, then you have many hypotheticals you can draw upon to help mm -hmm. you eliminate answer choices for the global one. And then you'll notice in some of the newer games, starting in exam 58 and up to the present, they often include a rule substitution or rule equivalency question. And oh, yeah, I've you've seen probably those. seen those. And they're, 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 they're kind of like a curveball because you have to totally reconceptualize the game. Mm -hmm. And a, a couple of tips on this. One of them is that you could just go through and practice all the rule substitution questions in isolation from every exam. That's a good idea. Because you know that 58, 59, 60, they're all going to have at least one. So if you just do the setup, the orientation question, maybe a few locals to get warmed up and then do the rule substitution and focus on those games specifically, you'll start to develop your own rhythm with those. That's, that's a good idea. I, I definitely am going to take that advice. That's great. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. And I can share a few more thoughts on these questions in particular. One of them would be, use your previous valid scenarios to help you eliminate wrong answer choices. Mm -hmm. Because if a, a given answer choice renders a previously valid scenario invalid, then it could not possibly be true because it's more limiting. And then if it allows scenarios that could not normally be allowed, it's less limiting and therefore can't be equivalent either. So the correct mm -hmm. answer is going to link that given answer choice with the other rules and you'll get an identical diagram or at least identical inferences as a result. Okay, yeah. Wow, this is so helpful. You're really helping me just completely see it in a different light. So I'm so glad you've spent, what, 10 years doing this? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's my pleasure, Lauren, because, you know, the thing is that a single insight about an exam like this can really change everything for you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to go it alone, spinning your wheels. That was kind of my position back when I was studying. And just going it alone with the prep test and some books doesn't always do it for you. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that we were able to have this chat. I'm wondering if there's anything else I can help you with, other major pressing questions, things yeah. that are giving you trouble, what's on your mind? Well, one question I have is just in general, um, how much do you see people um, actually improve their score? I mean, everyone talks about it, oh, I'm going to raise my score however many points, but how often do people actually raise their score and how many points is a reasonable goal? That's, that's a great question, and a lot of it depends on how people study. Even like the, L, the statistics from LSAC show that the average person improves less than three points on a retake. But that's just an average. And I'm sure there's a wide variation within that. Some people take a cold diagnostic on test day and then they study and then they improve significantly. So the cold diagnostic didn't mean much. Yeah. If you put in the studying consistently, you can improve a lot, especially from a cold diagnostic. I personally went from around a 152 to a 175. Wow. It, took me, it took me a year, but I got there. That's impressive, though. And so it took a tremendous amount of work. I did every LSAT prep test ever released and used every LSAT <laughs> that I could find. It was, it was grueling, and it was a lot of work. And I'm not saying you have to do that to do what I did, though. There are people mm -hmm. I meet who study for three months, six months, and potentially make that kind of score increase. 
it all depends on the kind of work you do it you do in terms of taking timed exams under real simulated test day conditions so i would suggest doing at least 10 of those and then okay. i would also suggest engaging in excruciatingly detailed review <laughs> everything you get wrong everything you have difficulty with what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made you pick it what ultimately makes it wrong was okay. the urging about the right answer that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct Hmm. So it's these traps of encouragement towards the wrong answer and traps of discouragement towards the right answer, away from the right, right answer. And so the people who make the big score increases, they're really looking critically at their own thought processes. It's not enough to do exam after exam, measure yeah. your results, be happy you're sad and move on. But I've got a ton of stories from past <laughs> students on my website. They're called LSAT Diaries. Mm -hmm. And they actually chronicle, people wrote in their own stories, their journeys along this way. And so you can see... I even linked them with all what their score increases were. So I have like someone who went from the low 140s to 164. There was someone who went from the 160s to the 170s, plenty like that. If you're starting lower, you can have a larger absolute point increase. Mm -hmm. If you're already at a 167, it's hard to go to 10 points. But if you're at 150, 160 is totally doable. 160 to 170 happens all the time as well. Okay, yeah, that's definitely good to know. And you talked a little bit about... Um, you know, mistakes in forming your thought processes. Are there particular mistakes that people tend to make on the LSAT or when studying for it? Yeah, totally. So mistake when studying for it, the biggest one I would say is not properly reviewing LSAT prep tests. We talked about that. But in terms of mistakes that people make in general, I would say one of the biggest things that stands out is just doing too much on the flip side, doing exam <laughs> after exam, you can, you can reach burnout with, with something mm -hmm. like that. So I'd say less is more sometimes. You do fewer exams and review them in more depth. That's the biggest takeaway I could give your listeners. Okay, yeah, that's, that's definitely good advice. I think there's, there's a good range of you know, not studying enough and studying too much and stressing yourself out. So I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yeah, the biggest thing is really consistency. Having a, a reasonable, properly thought out, day-by-day -day study plans so that you know exactly what to do every single day over the entire course of your prep. A lot of times people will wake up and they say, I want to study. What should I do? They'll just do another exam. But mm -hmm. that's, that's pointless. You're not learning anything from it. It's not enough to simply yeah. measure your progress and then you know, track it on a spreadsheet or something. You're, that tells you where you're at, but you're not gaining anything from that and you're just burning through material. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend creating a study schedule before you begin to study for the LSAT? Yeah, I absolutely would. And you want to make it reasonable for yourself. So someone in your position, Lauren, studying four to five hours a week, you would want to certainly assign yourself less work. But you'd mm -hmm. also want to, since you're busy, you'd want to block out specific time in your calendar to make sure the studying actually happens. And you, yes. don't, want to save it, you don't want to save it for like the last thing of the day after work and after school when you're, when you're beat. Mm -hmm. so I'd yeah, say, that's, that's true. So maybe during lunch, maybe before work or school, or maybe if you're in college on Fridays and treat it like a four credit class. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of free week by week schedules on my website, but then people wanted more. So I actually did go ahead and create day by day study plans for all different timelines, whether you're taking the LSAT in a month or taking it seven months from now. And they get super specific in telling you exactly what to do every single day, which prep test problems to complete, which, um, which, guide, which guides to use, which explanations to use, and how to go through it systematically, building a foundation. So you start with the foundation first, getting the fundamentals, then you go into pacing, doing timed sections, and finally endurance with full length five section exams with a 10 minute break. That is, yeah, that's great. I'm gonna have to check out some of those resources that you mentioned, because that seems wonderful. And it's, honestly, I just think it's wonderful that you, that you really devote so much time to this and that you wanna see students do well and it's not, um, the kind of competitive atmosphere that people talk about when studying for the LSAT or in law school. It's nice that you are so encouraging. Oh, I really appreciate that, Lauren. This is what I do full time. It's my passion. I love it. And I really love seeing the transformations in, in students' thought processes to come around to a different way of thinking. You know, mm -hmm. this way of thinking, this LSAT mindset, seeing the exam from the test maker's point of view and being critical and skeptical. These are skills that don't only apply to the LSAT, but they also carry forward into law school and into your career. So it's never too early to start adopting this new way of thinking. Yeah, that's, 
honestly, I just, I keep saying it, but really thank you so much for even reaching out to me and, and just wanting to chat about this because even just in this short conversation, I, I do think I am thinking about the LSAT and the way the questions are structured in a different way. So I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm really glad to help however I can, Lauren, and I hope that this is valuable for anyone watching on your channel or mine, and we can get some more people higher scores. Yeah, I hope so too. All right, well, I'll send you some of those links to include in the description, and I'll link everyone watching on my channel to your YouTube channel as well, so they can continue following your journey. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Of course, Lauren, my pleasure. Well, it was a pleasure chatting with you, and let's be in touch. Yeah. Let me know how it ends up going for you. I will. I'll definitely keep you updated. I'll let you know what my final score is. Maybe I'll write into LSAT Diaries. Yeah, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.